You are listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church, located in Sandpoint, Idaho. We invite you to come and join us as we rightly divide the word of truth and encourage one another through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, how's everybody doing this morning? Good. good. Yeah, I'm doing good. Doing great and starting this new diet, so I feel a little jittery because I haven't really eaten much, so I won't pass out or anything, though. No. promise you that. I knew this might actually hopefully get the slide. So if you can turn to your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to... Brother Eric, and I do appreciate Brother Eric asked me to teach this morning. Man, I love teaching. That's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I do apologize. I do have to go fast. And I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. So if you like to take notes, that's great. If you don't take notes, I suggest that you learn how to do that because... Just you're not going to get everything I'm going to say. And ask my wife. She said, "Like you know, one message should be four messages. That's just the way I am. I like to get in the weeds and I like to bring things out." But um, so we're going to go to Ephesians chapter six. And I was, you know, praying about what what the Lord wanted me to teach. And I like you know, as a preacher, you've been doing this for a long time. You got so many things in your mind and heart that's just swirling around all the time. You're thinking about, and then sometimes the Lord says, "That's what I want you to teach today." And what I was thinking about, what the Lord has given me, is that um, Paul tells us to put on some things. You know, it's interesting. If you do a study, um, study on what to put on and what to take off. And God, through Paul, gives us what to put on and what to take off. And I was thinking about, okay, Lord, that's what you want me to do. And I was thinking about it. Then he led me to Ephesians chapter 6 that he says to put on the whole armor of God. So in... There's a few things, though, that Paul tells us to put on. He tells us to put on the armor of light. He tells us to put on the Lord Jesus. He tells us to put on the new man. He tells us to put on the whole armor of God. He tells us to put on mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, and forgiving one another. And then in charity, he tells us to put on charity. So I think it's, you know, as as a believer, as a Christian, God requires us to put on some things. And especially, I've been saved now for 31 years, so... You know, you learn over time, and it does take time. You know, none of us are perfect. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God, and we're all constantly struggling with things. One of the things that I constantly struggle with is my mind, and I think probably all of us have that same struggle. A lot of the times we can bring our body into subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's, it's that mind that constantly wars on us and we, that we struggle with. So he tells us to put on a few things, but I want to focus on this morning on Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read... Um, about the whole armor of God. Are you guys all familiar with, you ever read about that and thought about that? I had, I had someone when I was early said, they said they just pray on the whole armor of God. It's not, that, not, that isn't how it works. It's, it's something you have to work at. This is a full-age Christian that he's talking about, and God wants us to be a full-age Christian. And if you're a new believer, you know, just take it in and, and work on some of these things. And I'm going to give you these six things, or these seven things, actually. There's seven things that he tells us to put on here. You guys know what the number seven is? Perfection. It's per- spiritual for perfection. And God is, God, he wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be complete. He doesn't want us to be, you know, reeling to and fro with every wind of doctrine in this world. He wants us to be complete. So he gives us here in Ephesians chapter um, 6 and verse 10, I'll, let's read it. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, that's the temptation, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, take in the shield of faith, Wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let's go ahead and pray since we didn't pray yet, and we'll get into this. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your goodness and mercy, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your precious word that you've given us. Lord, I thank you for just the encouragement and the hope that you've given us through your word. Dear God, I thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ and dying on Calvary and shedding your precious blood to give us eternal life and give us that hope and that joy that we long and look forward to, Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here he gives us um, seven things 
of this armor. And you, you can't physically put this armor, of course. And it's not like you, this is something you have to practice. This is something that you have to perfect. And we know that the, the scriptures tell us, you Paul, that we're supposed to perfect ourselves. We're supposed to work on things constantly. We're supposed to be growing in the Lord. That's how you grow in the Lord is by putting on these things or practicing or pinpointing things in our life. Like, Lord, I know I'm weak in this area. I know that I'm weak in prayer in my, in, my, in my walk with the Lord. And I try to do it all the time, but I'm not consistent. Sometimes like, oh man, I forgot to pray today. And the next day it's like, I'm gonna make sure I do it today. So it's something that there's things in our lives that we have to work on all the time. And I think this is something that Paul wants us to work on. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to work on to perfect ourselves in our walk with the Lord. And here Paul has given us an illustration of, you know, the first, second, third century, you know, Roman soldier. You guys are familiar, anybody familiar with Roman soldiers and how they, their armor that they had on? And that's the illustration that Paul has given us. Paul has given us that picture of a Roman soldier. And he wants how to be full. This is how he wants us to be a perfect um, spiritual believer to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. In this passage here, he mentions that the Lord wants us to stand. He doesn't want us to lay down or give up. And it's easy to get discouraged and lay down and give up. Trust me, there's, sometimes the devil throws things at you. It just wants, he just wants you to quit. But as, as believers and as, as the Lord Jesus Christ leads us in the path that he's given us, we cannot quit because not just for the sake of every believer, but for the sake of the lost, we have to keep going. But he gives... So here, if you look back in this passage in Ephesians 6, I'm going to move through these verses, so if, I won't have time to have everybody look at it or read it, but I will give you the reference if you want to write it down. But here he says, in, um, he says the wiles of the devil. You know what a wile means? You ever think of, when I thought of wiles, I thought wily coyote. <laughs> what is wily, wily coyote always trying to do? He's trying to outsmart, outsmart and kill the roadrunner yeah. by every means necessary. And I was like, that's how the devil is. Yeah. He will come at you in every direction. If he can't get you one way, he'll try to use people around you to get to you. And if he can't do that, he'll figure out some other way. He's always, it says, and the definition of while is trickster, ensnare, deceiver, sly, and beguiler. He, he's always, always after us. And you just, you just got to figure out, Lord, I need your help. And I, that's one of the things I do. I ask God, I need your help. Help me, help me to see, help me to be discerning, help me to be watchful. But he, the devil, wants, he wants the, the advantage. At 2 Corinthians 2.10, says, To whom ye forgave anything, for I forgive also. For I, if I forgive anything to whom I forgave, for your sakes forgive it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I'm not going to go all the devices of the devil, but one of his devices to get an advantage of us is the lack of forgiveness. That's how he splits churches. He gets people, somebody says something wrong, you hear something, you're like, and you get offended by it, and that's how he splits, and then you don't forgive. For la the lack of forgiveness will kill, kill relationships and churches and real fast. Um, he, he's, he's always seeking. And over in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because the ad your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking who he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He tells us, Peter tells us to be sober. It doesn't mean sober as far as no alcohol, drugs, and all that stuff. He's talking about sober. Um, you know, I did 20 years in the Navy, and one of the things that when you're in a combat zone and you've you got enemy around you, you've got bullets flying and stuff, you have to have your head on a swivel because you, you don't know who's going to kill you. And it's a lot. And it, it's easy for me to relate because I've been in those situations where I've been in firefights and I've been in situations in Iraq where you don't know if you're going to live or die. And sometimes... You don't know what the enemy's going to do. And we've had guys killed at the most weirdest ways because they're not necessarily always killing you by lobbing a rocket or shooting at you from distance. They sneak up on you and you're not paying attention. And that's a lot how the devil is. He's, he's constantly, that's why he says to be vigilant. And they always told us, you know, all, most of our operations were vigilant this, vigilant that because we're going in, we're, we're the offensive and we're not the defensive. We're like going in and taking out whoever needs to be taken out. And... He tells us to be sober. That means your, your mind should always be thinking about the things of God and thinking about how can I encourage my brother or looking out. I, I always try to think, you know, when I look at different people, the people I meet, you can tell sometimes right away if something's bothering them. And sometimes that's a good opportunity to say, hey, what's going on? 
and, and even your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's, it's important to know for you or for me that I can pray for you about something or you can pray for me about something. Um, that's being sober. That's being vigilant. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 1. You're in a spiritual war whether you like it or not. It's just, you know, some people, you know, get saved and it's great. You know, when you first get saved, it's like marriage. The honeymoon's great, but then the seriousness in and you got to keep working at it day in and day out. But we're in a warfare and it doesn't matter where you're at in life. I mean, even I'm retired now and, you know, it's, it's a constant battle of the mind. I'm not necessarily fighting, you know, on a battlefield anymore. I'm not necessarily fighting different enemies. I'm fighting a spiritual warfare in my mind. And here he tells us in 2 Timothy 2.1, he says, Thou therefore, my son, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. You should be able to, able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husband that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. So he's, here uh, Paul tells Timothy, we're supposed to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And it's not just, you know, he's, he addresses men because he's addressing a preacher. But it's not, it's not always preachers that, that can practice this. Even ladies can practice this. Even kids can practice this because he's after every one of us. He's after my kids, you know, and, and they got to learn as we teach them. You need to be aware and we're always teaching them. Be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you talk to. We're teaching them. What, we're, what I'm going to be teaching this morning, they're, they're putting on the whole armor of God, in a sense, step by step, so they can be vigilant, be sober, and go, and, oh, that kid, that's not, and it's the same with us in life, you know, sometimes in work, you, uh, being in the Navy, or, you know, what that they say about the Navy, it's horrible, it's, they're filthy, they're vile, but you got to be a light and a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, he wants us to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We know that the devil is our enemy. And so Paul tells us seven things that we need to do to, to help ourselves withstand those things. And the first thing is your loins gird about with truth in verse 14 there. So you guys, you ever study back the history as far as the loins and the garment? So the Roman soldiers usually wore a pretty long gown, some of them. And even in Jewish, they wore a long gown. When, when he says gird up the loins, they took that gown and they tied it up around their waist. And whenever they did that, that was they're going to work, they're going to play, or they're going to war. But they always wore that long thing. So that's, that's the illustration that, that Paul has given us, to gird it up, be ready for anything. But here he's telling us to gird ourselves up with truth. Look over at John chapter 17, if you want to, if you have time. I'm going to read fast. So your strength is in your loins. You know, your, your loins is your, your hips down to your knees. That's your strength is right there. And what do they tell you? These, my boys are doing karate right now. They're doing um, Kempo karate. And they always, you know, they're, they're always make them stand there, you know, and they push them in different directions to, so they don't fall. So your loins is your strength. That's where your balance is. And if you're off balance, just like a soldier, you're not going to be able to fight that good fight of faith. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to be caught off guard. Um, just an interesting thing that crossed my mind is that when I was thinking about this, you know, when the Roman soldiers fought, you ever watch those, you know, sometimes in movies they show you these, these Roman soldiers are full, fully geared out as this, and they're standing interlocked with their shields in rows. And so when those, those, the enemy comes, they can withstand that blunt force that's coming at them. I love watching that stuff. I don't know, I, I like... Old warfare, modern warfare, all that stuff is just like, it fascinates me when, it, when you look at that. But if you think about it, if we're going to take that and apply it to a spiritual truth, we're going to look at ourselves, okay, we're all supposed to be soldiers or growing. You know, we might back, be in the back, you know, watching the big boys fight sometimes. But we're all soldiers and we're, we're in this fight. But you know what makes you stronger is when you're interlock, interlocking your shields. They, they interlock their shields because that makes less of a hole for them to stab you or spear you because a lot of the foreign places they use really long spears that they would run through those holes but if you think about it in the spiritual truth it's a lot like our spiritual life if we're not we cannot be by ourselves in fighting that fight that's why we and, we'll, and paul addresses it here 
we have to be interlocked together. That's why God created the, the, the church to be able to come together, to be strengthened by one another, to pray for one another, and to hear truth. Because that makes us stronger. And it, it helps us to not you know, give in to the, the, the things of the devil. But John chapter 17 says, um, And now I am not, no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, keep them in thy name. Those that thou givest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now I come in, I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the word hated, hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the truth is the word of God. The truth, we think sanctify us through truth. Sanctified means set apart and meet for the master's use. We're, we're sanctified in Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to gird up the truth in our minds. Like, well, you can't really do that in a, you know, I'm going to gird up the truth today. No, how are you going to get that truth in your mind and heart? It's by being, you know, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together um, because the day is getting closer. We're going to receive more opposition and more attacks. So we need the truth of the Word of God. We need the preaching of word, the Word of God. We need the teaching of the Word of God. And we need to be in the Word of God daily because that's where you can get your truth from. The truth is what makes you strong because, you, you know, when you go out into the world and you might meet somebody, it's like, hey, I'm going to try to witness to them. And they come out, sometimes they come out with some weird stuff. Way out there, and you're going, whoa, that's like, what in the world? Where do they get that? Because their mind or their body and their loins are not girt up with the truth. But if we have the truth, guess what? That makes us strong because we go, I have the truth. Praise God and thank the Lord Jesus Christ that I got the truth. He's given his, me his book that I know what the truth is. Amen. And then we try, to, you know, we try to help them as we can. But sometimes it, there's all kinds of things, and I can't get into all that stuff that's like a whole nother you know, I could run that rabbit trail as far as the deception and the deceiving and all the false doctrine that's out there. But, but that's, that's doctrine. Doctrine is truth. When you learn the doctrines of the Word of God, and sometimes it's, you know, as you grow in the Lord, you learn the basic doctrines of the faith, and then God begins to add to that and add to that. And then pretty soon you become a, that, that full-age Christian where you're like, no matter what you hear, you're going, that's not right. The Scripture says this. That's right. And that's what, I, we, you know, we meet people that are of other religion. And they're like, uh, they'll say something like, um, whatever, they think it's truth. But you're going, well, that's not in the Bible. Where did you get that from? And most of them, like, we, we have a, my wife has a friend that's a seven-day Adventist. And everything she says and everything she believes is from Ellen G. White. If you want to study the, occult, the cults and all that junk, it's just, they're so, and we were listening to a guy that she recommended we listen to him. I go, and he would say, I'm a, I'm a, was it, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. And he's saying this stuff, and I'm like going, that's not even in the scripture. Where did you get that? How could you be a Bible believer if you're not even believing what, what's in the Bible? It's their own from this lady. So it's no wonder the devil ta attacks doctrine. What does it talk about in the last days? That they're, gonna, they're not going to endure sound doctrine anymore. And it's important for us, if you're in here, to have a successful walk, however long the Lord has for us before he takes us home, is to get in that word and study the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ and what Paul has given us. And it, it'll, it'll make us strong because the devil, he wants to attack it and tear it down. Because what do you hear all the time? Oh, doctrine's not important. We just need Jesus. No, it, you know, I think it says over in Psalms about he has exalted his word above his very name. Amen. I don't, you know, I meet somebody, oh, I love Jesus. You know, and you're going, what in the world? You know, it's just way out there, you know. And I'm like going, the Bible says this. Oh, I don't care what the Bible says. I just love Jesus. Like, well, either you're not saved or you're just like out there and deceived or whatever. But. So doctrine's important. Truth, you've got to gird your loins up with truth. It'll make you stronger. And the second thing he says is the breastplate of righteousness. What do you think about that breastplate? You ever see the Roman soldier, the breastplate? they got this big shield cover. Now we have sappy plates, you know, that we wear in combat back and front. We don't, that back then, they didn't have anything in the back. But they had those, the big metal armor. And that, that breastplate protects your vital organs, your heart your lungs, your liver, you know, all your vital organs there. And 
it says righteousness. Well, righteousness, if you look up the definition, it says purity of heart, rectitude of life, conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness, as used in the scripture, um, equivalent to holiness. So you can see that righteousness is important. Of course, God is righteous. That's where we get our, our, our holiness and our righteousness. Um, and it's applied to God, the perfection of holiness of his nature. Um, the, you look up the word holiness is a state of being holy, purity, uh, freedom from sin, sanctity. And I, it reminds me of 1 Peter 1.16, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. God wants us to be holy. That righteousness, that means purity of heart. We need to keep our hearts pure before the Lord. Um, you know, if you have a, a good, clean conscience, that's why I say if, you know, you can go through life and, and if I know if I, if I look at something or I say something sometimes and the Lord says, no, that's not right. That's that, you know, the Holy Spirit within you convicting you of, of what you said or heard or, or, or seen. Um, but you want to you want to strive to be holy over in four and Proverbs 420. It says, my son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all thy flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And you can do that whole study of the heart. The mind and the heart is such a fascinating study, how it's um, connected to one another. But your heart is, what, is, what did Jesus say? It's out of the heart. Out of, it's not at the mouth. You know, they were talking about the disciples eating certain things that defiled. No, it's what's in the heart. What, what's coming out of your, uh, out of your mouth? You know, it, and you can easily see people that say they're Christians, you know, and then they'll say things and do things. You're going, whoa, that's what's coming out of their heart. So something's not right in their heart. Either they're not guarding their heart or they're allowing the filth of this world to get in their heart. So he says that to keep it with all, with all diligence. We're supposed to strive. And that's what's going to make you a successful Christian in this world. Keeping your heart clean and pure before the Lord. That's what righteousness is. We should be seeking holiness. Number three. So gird up the loins of your mind. The breastplate of righteousness. And then it says in number three is the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In order to be a successful Christian, you ought to be ready to give an answer for what the hope that's within you. And look at that in 1 Peter 3.15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that reason they speak evil of you as evildoers, maybe be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So they... They're always, I mean, in the military, I had, sometimes they just want to, they call it being thrown under the bus. And they do, just because they don't like how well you work. You're running circles around them, and they just can't figure out why. I just, you know, it's the Lord. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do this for the Lord, not for anybody else. But that's the preparation. Having the preparation of the gospel is not just witnessing to somebody, but it's having that people see your conversation on your work, in your workplace or wherever you go in life. It doesn't matter where you're at, but your conversation, you're either preaching Christ or you're not preaching Christ. And it could be verbal preaching or it could be just them watching you. You know, people see us going through stuff. People are watching us. We have lost people. We have people of other religions. When, when our son died, they're watching us. They're going, why? I mean, they don't understand. How come you're handling it so well? It's only the, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't explain it. All I like to say is, it, when I got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ put the Holy Spirit in me, and I have that peace that passes all understanding. That's all I can say. Amen. And they look at that and go, well, you're going to say, well, I want some of that. I want what you have. Yeah. Oh, they're, you know, they're going to watch you even more. And sometimes they watch you for a very long time before um, anything happens. But you just keep praying for them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.1 um, we're supposed to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to preach the word. And it says, And I, brethren, when I come unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of God, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the spirit, uh, power of God. We're supposed to 
um, preach the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And I, I you know, you, you see these and you go, and your mind goes off. So, man, I could tell you a hundred illustrations for every one of these. You, you think of all these things, you know, people, they go, wow, that's a great guy. I mean, he's such a great preacher. Uh, I'm going to go to preaching. And you listen to him and you go, but I'm not getting anything. Something's not right. But they're really great orators. So they can, they can preach. It's not in how you present it. Because if you're presenting the word of God, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, I've been doing this for a while. You, you could, you know, get up there and be trembling and your, your speech is, you know, contemptible and just like Paul sometimes. But you're preaching the word of God. That's where the power is. Right. And men, uh, you know, men in general need to realize the power is in the word of God, not in me. Amen. It's not in you. Just give them the word. Just give them the book. Give them the word. Give them the book. And leave it up to God. We're not going to, we're not, and I've, I've struggled with this because I've, I've witnessed and preached to so many people and they just won't get saved. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? And I get so frustrated. And the devil wants you to get frustrated and get just like, Ugh, what am I doing wrong? And God says, just preach the word, be faithful to witness, just keep giving it and leave that up to me. What it says, you know, some water, some uh, plant some water, but God give it the increase. Right. And it's just, we just need to learn to be, to have that peace of mind and, and just preach the gospel. Just leave it up to God. And somebody would just have so much more peace in their life. I know some people get so worked up over that. I'm like, man, just leave it alone and just preach it. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not us. That's why he's chosen, chosen the foolish things. And I don't, I was going to tell the illustration, but I may not have time for that. Um, 2 Timothy 4.1, he says to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they keep themselves teachers, having itching ears. Um, preach the word. That's all you got to do. And it doesn't matter. You, have to, you don't have to know the whole Bible. You just preach your testimony. Preach your testimony. That's what the gospel is. Just tell them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just leave it up to God. The fourth thing, so we have, we gird about your, your loins with truth, breastplate of righteousness, feet shot of the preparation of the gospel. Then he says the shield of the faith. That shield of the faith, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Without, without having faith, that, that you're, you're going to get hammered like crazy by the devil. And it's, that's why when we talk about the interlocking of the, of the shields, that's our faith. What happens when we get together in fellowship? Our faith is strengthened. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm around more believers and you're in church, it, your faith is strengthened. And over Hebrews chapter 11, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the words, worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made with the things that do appear. Faith, faith has a substance. You're, you're hoping what, what God is, what you've heard as far as the preaching of God's word, that you're, you're, you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you have faith in that. And that's what, that's what blocks those fiery darts of the devil. Over in Romans ten fourteen, it says, Faith cometh by hearing. How then shall they call on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's important to strengthen our faith. We got to hear the word of God. You ever, you know, have you ever been in a place? I've been in places sometimes where you're just, it's just like, go, 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 go. And you have no time to read your Bible. You have no time to pray. You, you, well, sometimes it's not even around any other believers because most of the guys that were with us, there might be one guy that's a Pentecostal or something. There's no, there's no one around. And if you're not hearing that word of God, guess what happens? Your faith gets weaker and weaker and weaker. You know, man, I just need to get in that word again. And that's what, yeah. when I, the more I spend in that book and the more time I hear preaching, and we, me and my wife, we go places now, we're driving an hour, we listen to preaching. We go to the grocery store in Coeur d'Alene, we listen to preaching. We're just constantly listening things because it makes you more well-rounded and it helps you with your faith. Right. It gives you stronger faith. Yep. And Romans eight twenty seven, 27. Um, faith that God knows, he, he knows what he's doing. I, and we've, 
gone through some things, and not, not everybody goes through the same things. But sometimes in order to strengthen your faith, God has to put you through some things to make it stronger. And you think about, well, you know, you think about this, you think about that Roman soldier or any military. Um, in order to do that, you have to go through boot camp. You have to go through certain trainings, specialized training sometimes. A long time you go into, because we did, I was a corpsman with the Marines, and I was constantly going through the same scenarios of, you know, guy falls down, and your chief goes, okay, he's got a chest, sucking chest wound. What do you do? And you're like, you keep on going through these scenarios over and over and over again, but you're never really practicing it until you get to a combat field. And it's like, it's really happening now. Bullets are really fine and people are really dying. But God, he knows what he's doing in order to bring you to a place of where he wants you. And that's why I look at Romans eight twenty eight, and it says, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. Whatever happens in my life, he knows what's going on. I can't, I can't stop it. I can't explain it. Sometimes you just got to, and when you get to that point, we're like, okay, God, I know. And it gives you strength. I've never, I don't know, I, I guess any of my walk with the Lord, you, you really look at some of the things that God puts you through. It's like, oh, I know what you're doing now, Lord. I'm starting to see it. And sometimes it's hard for us to have that faith if we're not really, we're not really looking at it from, from the Lord's perspective and going, okay, I know all things work together. He's, he's called us for a purpose. Sometimes we don't know what our purpose is if we're young in the Lord. Sometimes as you go along, you're going, okay, this is where he's bringing me. I know what he wants me to do. These are, and even sometimes, like I was going to mention before, um, I grew up, I was shy. Like you guys are shy. I was very shy. I would not get up in, in, in you know, school plays, speech. I'd rather fail. No way. And when I got saved, I had uh, a brother, a uh, friend of mine say, you want to get up and teach before we went out and preach on the street? I'm like, no, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Scared to death. No. And then God calls me to preach. It's like, you want me to do what? <laughs> no, that means I have to get up in front of people. I'm like, there's no way. But you know what? God, God, God knows and, and it doesn't, it's not like go to Crete and you get up and you know, you're an evangelist or something. No, it takes many years of sometimes putting you out in that, those little fights and God's got your back and he's, he's putting that heavy heat on you and he's putting more weight on you and you're going, what in the world's going on? Why do I feel like I'm just so heavy and so oppressed? Because he's got something where you're going to run at some point where he's just going to let you just run with it. And he's, he's gifted you with all these different gifts. And it's kind of like this, Roman soldier, where he's, he's given them all this equipment. You think of, you know, what is all that equipment for? It's all for a purpose. There's a purpose behind each every little piece of that armor that that Roman soldier had. Um, so we got loins girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the, of the wicked, that full body shield. And then we have the helmet of salvation. So the helmet of salvation, this is where... This is where your mind comes in. Your, your mind, you have to protect your mind. Because like I said before, your, the, my struggle, if there's anything that I struggle with, it's, it's the mind, the processing that's going on up there sometimes. And the devil just throws something at you and you start thinking about it and next thing you're down in the gutter going, why do I feel this way? Because your mind ran you in the gutter. You've got to protect that mind. You've got to have that helmet of salvation. And that helmet of salvation, and I, you know, I think... As you grow in the Lord, I think the older I get, maybe it's an age thing because I've heard of other men, once they get past 50, they start doubting their salvation and stuff. And I was like, I've never really had any struggle with doubting my salvation. Maybe because I'm past that age now and they're like, I'm starting to think sometimes, and I've talked to my wife, I don't know why, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm struggling with my believing that I'm saved. Because I'm not, you know, and the devil puts out, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, you're not doing this. And I'm like, no, no. God saved me. I remember the day that I got saved. I remember that God is the things and he brings up in your mind all the things that God has done in your life. That's that helmet of salvation. It, it keeps you on track. As a, like I said, I don't, everybody might be different, but I struggle mentally with, with a lot of things. I struggle a lot with discouragement. I struggle a lot with depression sometimes. And all it is to the devil, he's just oppressing you. And, of course... I figured out, too, that food has a lot to do with that, too, because you eat certain foods and like, why do I feel depressed? Oh, I just ate a bucket of ice cream. That's why. <laughs> it, 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 I don't know. It does some weird stuff. I don't know what they're putting in there, but man. But a lot of it is spiritual, and, and the devil has 
a way of attacking, attacking our mind. Over in 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So he says to gird up the loins of your mind, just like your tr- the truth. You got to gird up that mind. You got to, and what, you know, you think of that mind, it's what you see, it's what you hear. And, you know, and sometimes I'm guilty of it myself. Well, I'll, I'll watch something and I, I just feel dirty afterwards. And that's like I'm watching like really bad stuff. It's just, some stuff is just, yeah, it's kind of like the middle of the road. Sometimes even that PG stuff is like, yeah, we're not watching that again. Because they're constantly, and it's not necessarily dirty, filthy stuff. It's their agenda. And we've even watched some kids' films. They see, oh, this new kids' film out, and they've got something in there. And it just makes you feel. So you've got to be careful about your mind. Because that, what happens is it gets in your mind, and then it goes down in your heart. Um, it, it's just, that's the way it goes. In your mind, in your heart. Um, 2 Corinthians 10.1. We're supposed to cast down. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who, is, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold towards you. But I beseech you that I am not uh, be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the, strong, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through, the, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every think, high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Are you good on that? Because <laughs> sometimes I'm not. But that's, that's what's going to make you that, that soldier that, that the Lord wants. You've got to bring those thoughts into captivity. Sometimes it happens everywhere. I'm definitely not here. I have not seen it, but... We be in the military, been all over the place, been to different churches, and somebody says, "Did you hear so and so this and this?" And they're going, I, "There's no proof to that. It's just like I look at the media and everything's going on. There's no proof. I don't all that. They can deceive you with those images and with what they're saying on the the news and stuff. That's cast those imaginations down because that stuff. And trust me, I like I like conspiracy theories. I like all that stuff. <laughs> and I'm like going, I start looking at that and I start thinking about it, and you're going. You know what? I'm not being a very effective. I'm not casting down those imaginations because a lot of it is just my imaginations. It's not. There's nothing factual about it, and that's where you have um, a victory in your mind is by casting those things down. When you hear something about somebody, unless you physically saw them doing it, don't believe it. I, you know, I've heard people say, "I, you know, preacher so and so is doing this." Well, where's the proof? It's just it's just rumors and that stuff. We're supposed to cast that stuff down, cast those imaginations. It says, um, pulling down strongholds. You know, when you allow that stuff to build up, it becomes a stronghold. And we've seen other believers fall into some stuff, not necessarily they just weak, got into stuff, and then there's all this talk. And guess what? They're under this, they're in captivity by the devil. They're in this stronghold. We're supposed to pull that down. We're not supposed to allow that stuff to have victory over us. Because we will not be an effective Christian if we, if we allow it. So cast down those imaginations. Number six. Loin, so we go through again. Loins go about truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. And full body shield. That's that whole body shield that protects us. And then the helmet of salvation. The next one, number six, is the sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. Um, that sword of the spirit. The, the sword of the spirit is, if you look at... The Roman soldier, he's a common foot soldier. He doesn't have some long sword where he's hacking and, and dicing. No, it's a, a very short, and they call it a gladius. And what he's doing, he's in that, in that shield, he's just doing little stabs. You know, think about, you know, I thought about, yeah, that's when, you know, he's pricked in the heart. Paul was pricked in the heart. That's the word of God. He pricks you. It's that conviction. It's not there to kill you, necessarily. It's just there to cause little injuries here and there. And then eventually, we all know that if you don't treat injuries, especially back then... You get gangrene and die. That's just the way it is. But so we should not look at the 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 sword of the spirit as if we're going to hack people to death. I don't. I when I even witness to even false religions and stuff, they're deceived. They're in deception, and I'm not going to hack them to pieces. No, I'm just going to give them the word, and they either reject it or they accept it. And the same with, 
you know, if you know a brother that's, that's walking or living in air, you just, you don't go and hack them to pieces, but it happens a lot in Baptist circles, especially in the South. Man, they get knocked down and they kick them and stomp on them until they're completely dead. And it's like, really, man, show the guy some grace. The, the Word of God is that it's not there to destroy you as a, as a believer. And we're definitely not here to, I mean, that's up to God. You know, God is the revenger of, of all that stuff. No, we just go out there and give them the gospel. Give it to them in love and in peace. And sometimes you can say some things that are really nice and they say, man, that guy's mean. How am I mean? I was just giving you the word. You know, leave that up, up to the Lord. So that sword of the spirit. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 4, if you, uh, you guys remember the story when, when Jesus fasted for 40 days and he went out in the wilderness, how did he fight the devil? The word. The word. You know, I, you meet people, you know, they're rebuking the devil and they're, you know, they're like, try, you know, I ain't taking on the devil, man. He's too wise, too intelligent. Lord, you take him on. That just, and sometimes, you know, when you're out, whether on the streets or whatever, um, people come up to you and say some of the weirdest, dead, weirdest things. And sometimes the Holy Spirit says things through the Word. You just quote the Bible to them. And they, man, they hate that. When you quote the Bible to someone that's lost, especially if they're a scoffer or they're, you know, sometimes they're employed by somebody. And you know, you're like, right off the bat, you're going, man, that guy, he's, he's got a different spirit in him or something. And you just, you give him the Bible. Because I can't say anything. I'm not smart enough. And none of us are really smarter than the devil is. So, so many people I see that they're trying to out intellect the devil and you ain't going to do it. Just all I say, give them the word, give them just, and, and as we've learned over the years and we've talked about this funny stories, that, you know, my wife go out and I go out door knocking and bus stuff. And we were at this one lady's house that I remember and we, and it was just like scripture after scripture. And we walked away going, where did all that come from? Because it's all hidden in my heart. All that, all that scripture we've memorized. That's why it's important for you young guys to memorize scripture because you get older, it's harder to memorize. I, I have a hard time memorizing things, but I'm having an easier time finding it if I stick with the same Bible. I know exactly where it's at. I can find it. But when, when you get in those situations, when you're combating the devil because he will come at you in any direction you imagine through a person, he doesn't come at you, you know, physically as far as him, seeing him. But he comes to you to people, and especially religious people, because they're always they always got these questions. Well, what about this? Well, the Bible says this. No, what about this? The Bible says this, and they get mad and you know frustrated, and leave. So always combat the devil with the word. That's the, that's the sword of the spirit. It's not in our power. It's not in our strength. Um, okay, number seven. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. This is probably one of the most important things, and we all can do this. We all can pray. And you got to realize the power of prayer. I, you, you, sometimes you pray for something or you pray for someone, and it doesn't always happen. You know, the will of God, he's, he knows his, it's his will, but we still should pray. Pray for those people because we all need prayer. And I, don't know, I know about me as far as, like I said, my, you know, I struggle with mental things, um, Doubts come in, you know, God tells you to do this and you're constantly doubting it and then people bring doubt upon it and it's just, you're constantly struggling with that and prayer is one of the best ways you can help a brother or sister in Christ is just praying for them. Um, you don't, sometimes you don't know what's going on in their life and sometimes they don't want you to know what's going on in their life and you say, you know what, and if you can, I don't know about you but I can't remember everybody. Sometimes God lays specific people and things on my heart and then other times I go off there, it's like, oh man, I should have prayed for that person. I, did, I forgot. And it's, it's really hard. And it's better to sometimes just keep a list so you remind yourself. But praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, pray without ceasing. We're supposed to pray without ceasing. That's what, that means, you know, if you have someone that needs a need or maybe you have a need, don't stop praying about it. Sometimes God doesn't answer it for years. <laughs> His timing is not my timing. Sometimes you want it to happen now. You want it fixed now. I want the situation fixed now. But God says, no, I'm not going to let it be fixed right now. It's going to take time and healing. And you're going to have to sometimes but just keep praying about it. It's not that he doesn't hear you praying about it. He hears it. But it's his timing, not mine. 
It says, uh, First um, Timothy 2.8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So he wants us to pray everywhere. Yeah. You don't have, you know, I've heard some people, you only have to lay down prostrate on the floor and pray. That's it. You don't pray any other way. I'm like, well, he says pray everywhere. How am I supposed to lay it on my face in the middle of a, in my car? You know, I'm driving on the road. No, pray everywhere. It doesn't matter where you're at. I've even, you know, pray with your eyes open. It doesn't matter. God hears your prayers. And who cares what everybody else thinks? And who cares what everybody says the way it's supposed to be done? He's pray everywhere and pray without ceasing. It doesn't matter where you're at. Sometimes you're in a situation where you need to pray now. <laughs> right. Just lay it out there. God, help me. I need some help right now because if you don't, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in a mess. Um, and there's other times, you know, he's just pray. God, thank. And it does say, say to be thankful. Be thankful in all things. Thanksgiving. Pray for your food. Thank, your, thank God for your food that he's given you. It's pray for everything. In Romans twelve twelve it says, Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Pray instantaneously. Don't wait. If you've got something to pray, pray about, that's why I say you don't have to be in any particular place or do it any particular way. Be instant in prayer. Pray if you're in the store and you see something, pray about it. Say, God, help that person. Help me to be a witness to that person. I don't know how many times I've, I've seen somebody and God says, I want you to witness or give them a track. And you're like going, ah, I don't know. It's like, and you're afraid of that rejection. And you're like, okay, I want to do it. Give me the boldness to do it. You know, but pray without, pray instantaneously. And he mentions in that, in that verse there, it says supplication. That word supplication means entreaty, petition, earnest request, pleading, perseverance, and persistent. So that means... You, you, you know someone has a problem or even a problem in your own life? Just supplication. Be persistent about it. You know, it, God doesn't mind if you're, you know, begging him. Say, like, God, I need some help now. You, <laughs> you need to show up now and help me. Or for this person, it's like, God, they, they, they got this sickness or whatever. They need help right now. That's supplication. And God wants us to, be, to go to the throne of grace boldly. He doesn't want us to... No, I think it's, my time's up and I'm almost done. <laughs> so prayer and supplication we should think on these things um, Philippians 4 6 be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are good to report if there be any virtue if there be any praise think on these things so instant prayer, we're supposed to, um, supplication, um, we're supposed to keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, and we're supposed to think on those, those things of virtue, those things of praise, you know, and that's what that especially goes in and kind of ties in with the whole, the mental thing when you're struggling with stuff. Think of a good, good, and sometimes you have to because the devil is just hammering you, but try to think of a good thing that happened in your life that God has blessed you with. You know that song, Count Your Blessings. And it's easy to not count your blessings because we're too busy thinking about what's going on right now and what's before me. And sometimes you've got to say, God, I, help me to think about some, some things that are lovely and some things that are good, like his word. Um, we're supposed to be watching. You know, that, that word watching, and I'm not going to go there because of lack of time, but we're supposed to be looking for the enemy in our life and others. And it's just like, you know, on an enemy's field, you're watching, you're looking. It's like your head on a swivel. You're always looking for the enemy, and you're always looking. It's like, is he sneaking up on me? I don't like. like I can tell you a story after story, um, being in combat places, but uh, being out at night and you're you know, walking around with MGs and you're always got any sleep, and yeah, you're like, you know, I, I, oh, that could be something over there. If you ever look through MG, NVGs, they're sometimes hard to see, especially the ones that we had. They were junk, you know, old, second or third generation, but. We're supposed to be watching and looking for the enemy because he could be like low crawling. That's what I think of the devil. He's, he's low crawling through the grass and he's trying to get really close to you. And then he's going to get you. And that's why it says to watch. And it, he mentions about his, his disciples, remember, in Mark about sleeping. He, he wasn't upset that they're physically sleeping, but they weren't. He was praying and they weren't, they weren't watching like he was. And that's what prayer is. You're watching. You're praying for God to give you that that mindset or that vigilance to say okay what's going on around me lord let me let me pinpoint because sometimes it's like things go over our head 
I don't know how you are. Sometimes you go over your head like, how did I not see that? And that's because we're not watchful enough sometimes. It says, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, it says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. So we're supposed to, to watch and to stand fast. That means stand in your place no matter what the opposition. And I think of, you know, not only in the combat situation, but sometimes you get, you're getting hammered so hard and there's so much against you, what happens? We want to move. We want to get out of that situation. Nobody says, like a soldier, you're in that combat, you're in that fight, you stand fast. Because the more you stand fa- fast and push against the enemy, you'll be more successful. And First Thessalonians 5, 6 is, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So we're supposed to be watching and be sober. So to tie this up as we go back to um, the seven things, loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and then praying always. And if you practice those and work on those things, you'll be a more successful Christian in your life. You'll have more victory over, not just in in church life, but just in your personal life. And if you're struggling with different things in your life, a sin, a besetting sin, or the weights in your life, you know, if you practice going through all these things as far as getting in the Word, praying, and asking God for help, and, and trying to do those things, God will help you. He'll make you a better Christian in your walk. So let's close in prayer and we'll be done. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everybody that has been here, Lord. And I pray that um, those that are maybe on their way, I pray that you just bless them, encourage them today, Lord. Strengthen them, Lord. Help them, Lord, to be able to go out in this world this week, Lord, and just be able to withstand all the fiery darts of the devil, Lord. And let people know that we're, we're not on the island alone, Lord. We're in the same boat. We're in the same fight, Lord. And I pray that you just help us to, be, to strengthen one another, encourage one another. And Lord, I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church. Please visit us at www.shepherdsgrace.org for more information.